uh, as I mentioned earlier, I went to seminary with Sean, or we went through the Immerse program together, and one of the assignments that I had to do in seminary was write a reflection on the difference between oral communication and written communication. So obviously preaching is a big part of serving as a pastor, so oral communication, but writing is an important part of ministry. And you would write different than you would speak. And as I reflected on the difference, uh, I focused specifically my studies on memes. Uh, If you don't know what a meme is, or a meme, as some of the older folks pronounce it, (laughs) some of you know. It is a caption photo. So it's a photo, stock photo, that different people use, and they'll put political commentary or cultural commentary. It's jokes, but on a picture. And one of my absolute favorites is what's called the bike fall template. So bike fall. Uh, And if Zechariah the prophet made a meme, this is what it would look like. So just people shoving the stick in the wheel, rejecting God. Oh, God, why did you do this to me? I'm like, you're the one who shoved the stick in there. Right? The, the joke in this meme is that we will blame other people for, a, for our own problems. Right? Zechariah ministered amongst the exiles. People would return from Babylon back to the promised land. And people who blame shifted like crazy. People who looked at the world around them and they were like, I can't believe this has happened to us. How did this ever happen? And they're still holding the stick. They're still holding the stick of their own disobedience. Uh, These people needed second chances, Zechariah's people, Uh, and more than that, they actually needed transformation, long-lasting, enduring transformation. What they needed was a new heart. So our big idea for tonight, new hearts lead to new lives. New hearts lead to new lives. Two points, the old heart and the new heart. The first one is the old heart. So Zechariah 7, starting in verse 1. In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month with his chislev. Now the people of Bethel had sent Sharezer and Regamelech and their men to entreat the favor of the Lord, saying to the priests of the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophets, should I weep and abstain in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, say to all the people of the land and the priests, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh for these 70 years, was it for me that you fasted? And when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Were not these the words that the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous with her cities around her and the south and the lowland were inhabited? We're going to skip a few verses. We'll come back to them. Don't worry. And continue in verse 11. But they refused to pay attention. Zechariah's people, they refused to pay attention. They turned a stubborn shoulder and they stopped their hearts that they might not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. As I called and they would not hear, so they called and I would not hear, said the Lord of hosts. And I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations that they had not known, thus the land was left desolate so that no one went to and fro and the pleasant land was made desolate. Kind of a dreary text on a otherwise pretty nice day. Uh, But this text has a lot of rich ideas that teach us God's design for his people uh, in our world. The historical context of Zechariah, hopefully not new to you, uh, as we've been going through this series, this rebuild series, we've been talking about the people of God and their history, the the things they lived through. Uh, They had ended up in Babylon in in exile, and 70 years later they returned. And this event is written in 2 Kings 25, verses 8 and 9. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem, every great house he burned down. Our text references a fifth month. That's where it comes from. In the fifth month, 70 years prior, the people of God had had their capital city destroyed. The temple destroyed. Every big house in this city, like the slums in Jerusalem were left there. They didn't care. The Babylonians didn't care about destroying them, but they destroyed everything else. But 70 years later, the people get to return. And 
we, they're led by some key leaders, Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and the prophets, Zechariah and Haggai, are among the group of people. And Zechariah's ministry specifically was one of preaching and preaching after one specific thing. He wanted the people to repent of the sin that had caused the exile. So I'll read you one of the first lines from Zechariah, his first oracle, his first prophetic word to the people. Zechariah 1, starting in verse 3, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried out, thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Zechariah is saying the people were warned. The people had prophets just like Zechariah and the prophets warned them and they didn't care. They kept doing their own thing. They lived like they wanted. And Zechariah is bringing the same message, return to me. But our passage, Zechariah 7, opens with a pretty simple question. Two leaders sent from the city of Bethel, right, a few miles away, show up to Jerusalem, and they have a pretty simple question. Should we abstain? Right, that, that's the phrasing for, should we continue to fast on the fifth month of the year? And it seems like a pretty simple question, uh, because the exiles had been practicing, as our passage told us in God's words, they'd been practicing a fast on the fifth month, as mourning for the exile. So every fifth month for at least the last three or four years, but probably the entire 70 years, that's why God uh, responds the way he does. Every time the fifth month of the year came around, that was a trigger to them. Let's mourn for the bad things that have happened to us. It reminded me of the movie Secret Life of Pets. I uh, highly recommend if you've not seen it. It is hilarious. Uh, there's a character in that movie named Snowball, an adorable little bunny, with wicked intentions, uh, and various times throughout the movie, as Snowball is confronted by various opposition, things will set him off, and he'll inexplicably stop, and he's like, R.I.P. Ricky, and he remembers his friend Ricky, who was a goose that tragically died trying to kill his owner. Uh, the movie, it's a kid's movie, so relax, it's not that dangerous, but Every time something triggers his memory, like, oh, you guys are escape pets. Ricky was an escape pet. R.I.P. Ricky. We remember you, dog. And then they escape danger, and they're like, Ricky, you escape danger too, dog. And over and over, every time something triggers his memory, Snowball reflects on Ricky. The, the exiles were kind of like that. The fifth month, every time the calendar turned, and they're like, R.I.P. Ricky. The temple, it was destroyed. The king's house, it was destroyed. God kicked us out of the land. And then for an entire month, they're just sad. They mourn, right? We're told that they're mourning. If we're going to think the highest thought about Zechariah's people, it seems like a pretty genuine question, right? Should we continue to fast? Uh, and it might have been motivated by the fact that the temple reconstruction had actually started, right? When Ezra had come back, that had been one of his primary tasks. Like he wanted to rebuild the temple, and we're told that he actually laid the foundation, but then they ran into some trouble. And these people are wondering, well, hey, if the foundation's laid and they're kind of working on it, maybe we don't need to fast anymore. Maybe it's a different kind of fifth month. Maybe it's a better day. But if we look at the broader literary context, if we look at what the other books written around this time say, I think the picture is a little bit darker. Ezra 4 tells us that after the temple foundation had been laid, that opposition arose and the project actually stalled. And it stalled for probably a year, maybe as many as two. And then in chapter 5, we're told that Haggai and Zechariah began preaching and rallying support. And then in chapter 6, we're told that in the sixth year of King Darius, the temple was finally completed. So somewhere in this four-year window, they got back to work. But Zechariah 7 is written in the fourth year of King Darius. So it is at least two years before the temple is actually completed. Maybe the people are just celebrating early. Maybe they're tired of mourning. But their practice of fasting had two significant errors. The way that they fasted, the mourning that was associated with it, they had made two significant errors. There was two misunderstandings. The first was that they had misunderstood what fasting actually is. 
Uh, You might be able to relate. Fasting is not a common thing in our world, but in the biblical world, it was a very normal practice. And fasting was abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. Richard Foster, a Christian guy, wrote a book about spiritual disciplines, and that's how he defined it. Simple definition, really basic That's what fasting is, when people abstain from food for spiritual purposes. The main reason someone would fast was because they wanted to get closer to God. Uh, They needed God's wisdom. They needed God's deliverance miraculously. Uh, They needed a prayer answered. And they're saying, God, if I abstain from food for this one day, for these three days, for this week, I actually won't die. But if you don't answer, I will. God, if you don't give me wisdom, I'll be ruined. And people would use this practice to draw near to God. Yahweh, in chapter 7 of Zechariah, turns in verse 6 and tells them a pretty biting question, a pretty biting response. Did you fast for me? Was it for me that you fasted? Right, and he's challenging the way that they're fasting. They're fasting as an act of mourning. Look at how hard our life is. I'm going to be sad for the entire month. And God challenges his people That's not what fasting actually is. Fasting is you turning to God and saying, guide me, help me, deliver me. Yahweh accuses them of selfishly fasting, focusing on the bad things that they'd suffered, but missing the bigger picture. And if they were going to mourn, there's one thing they should be mourning about. In Leviticus 23, I won't won't read it in the interest of time, but in Leviticus 23, you have a very specific command connected to the Day of Atonement, which was a a practice in Old Testament Israel where once a year, uh, a few animals would be sacrificed by the high priest, and ultimately it, it culminated in a goat being killed as a representative sacrifice for the sins of the people of Israel. And connected to this Day of Atonement, for an entire day, it was a mandatory fast, The people of God were supposed to abstain from food in commemorating this day. So their mourning would have been connected not to the bad things in their life, but to taking responsibility for their own sin, for saying, I actually have done things against God. I have rejected God's law, and I deserve death. But God in his mercy is allowing this animal to take my place. And as I abstain from food, I'm saying, God, thank you. I'm reflecting in mourning on my own sin, but mourning doesn't stay there. I reflect ultimately in thanksgiving to the God who delivers his people. So the people in Zechariah's day are mourning about their circumstances, but they fully misunderstood what fasting actually is. It's not supposed to be about mourning. And if you are mourning, you should be mourning about your own sin The rest of the Bible, the rest of the Old Testament specifically, gives us a a little more clarity on what fasting is supposed to be. In Isaiah 58, you're welcome to turn there, but I won't read it, but in Isaiah 58, God tells people, my design for fasting is that you would turn to me and that you would actually be changed as you reflected on who God is and what he's done for you so that you could live a different kind of life. And Isaiah accuses the people of God of fasting and then living like pagans, doing their own thing, fasting, mourning about their circumstances, and then treating people very poorly, rebelling against God's law. And he says, my act, my design, my desire for you, the design of fasting is that you would practice true fasting. You'd abstain from food and then do righteous things, that you would be the kind of people who help others. So the first error of Zechariah's people is they've simply misunderstood what fasting is supposed to be. But secondly, and more dangerously, they have a selective memory of the last 70-ish years. You see, what they remember is the temple being destroyed and the city being destroyed and being carried away through the desert to Babylon and then ultimately returning. But as they return, the land is still ruined and the temple is still not built and they are still mourning for the hard things that have happened to them. That's a very selective story. I want you to imagine with me that uh, you have a teenager in your house. For some of you, that might not require much imagination. You have a teenager in the house, uh, and in the house, pardon me, and you catch them sneaking out to a party, right? Late at night, they're not supposed to go. You told them not to, but they snuck out. You caught them, and as a repercussion for this, you take their phone or their video game console, and it is now out of their life, probably forever, uh, because you cannot trust them. And then you hear 
this teenager in your home telling their friend, yeah, you know, my life is crazy hard. Like, mom and dad got me locked up, and like, it's just tough. Like, I'm missing out on this beautiful summer, and I just don't know how this could have happened to me. What would your first thought be to that historical reconstruction? <laughs> You'd be like, is, is there like a why? <laughs> like, do mom and dad hate you, or maybe did you do something like kind of dangerous that could have been really bad for you? And, you know, not just rebelling against your parents, but putting yourself in a very compromising situation. They're like, Honestly, I don't remember. All I know is that I'm really suffering right now, and I'm just sad. <laughs> we would be pretty cynical of that young adult's storytelling, right? We would question, like, do you understand what you did? Do you recognize your disobedience was actually dangerous? Israel is like that teenager. They're like, oh, look how hard life is. And Zechariah is like, are you kidding me? You have still not returned to the Lord. You were, in you were in Babylon, you were in exile because you did not obey God's law. And you've returned and continued to disobey God's law. You don't understand what your story is. You don't recognize that you're actually in sin against God. So he gives them a rebuke. See, the root cause of the exile was Israel's persistent and unrepentant sinfulness. And God considers sin a very big deal. God's people owe him obedience because the people of God are in a covenant with God. A covenant is a word we don't use very much. Maybe you've been to a wedding this summer and you heard someone preach on it there. But in case you haven't, covenant is a word that means relationship, but a very specific kind of relationship. It is a relationship that comes with benefits and obligations. You gain something by being in the relationship, and because you're in the relationship, you actually owe something to the other person. We see it in marriage vows where you commit to partnership for a lifetime, and you gain partnership for a lifetime. What God had done with the people of Israel was he'd said, I will bless you, I will protect you, I will save you, and you will obey me, you will follow me. They gained the benefit of a relationship with God and his protection, and they had the obligation of obedience to God. As the Old Testament was written, we're reminded that if they obeyed God, they gained blessings. And if they disobeyed God, there were curses. So the people of God knew what God expected of them. And despite the fact that they knew the relationship they had with him, that they knew what God required of them, the way they remembered the story was, our life is just really, really hard. They did not take responsibility for their sin and the effect it had in their life, right? Returning to that meme I showed you earlier, right? Their rebellion was the stick in the tires, and as they've wrecked, they're saying, I can't believe this happened to me, failing to recognize that their disobedience was the root cause of all of their problems. The first seven verses of Zechariah 7 show us that the people had a repentance problem, they did not take responsibility for their sinfulness. But more than that, as we get to the end of chapter 7, we learn that the people actually have a deeper problem. They have a heart problem. They have a hard heart. Diamond heart is actually the language of the text. They don't feel bad about what they've done. And Zechariah reflects on that and warns them of stubborn shoulders, stopped ears, and most jarringly, a Diamond heart. If we were going to summarize these colorful images in just a word, we would say uncoachable. They did not take direction. They were living in rebellion against God. God would send prophets and they would say, no. We have a, a few kids, my wife and I. We have three little people that live at home with us. The middle one is just learning to speak. And his most common word is no. And it's, he's as assertive as his dad, so it is not like a, no. It's, no, no. And he'll like wave the head, and he'll run the opposite direction. So my son has a powerful will uh, and resists coaching at every turn. When dad tells him, son, stay off the street, there are cars coming, no. When dad tells him, don't eat that bug, no. <laughs> when dad tells him, you cannot play with scissors, no! August refuses coaching because he thinks he knows best. It's kind of cute in a 19-month-old. 
in grown men and women who have known God, who were rescued by God, who were given God's law, who were given God's blessings. Disobedience is not that cute. And Zechariah is challenging the people. You, you have a diamond heart. Something is wrong with you. you you're ignoring the warnings. The same reason that you were exiled continues to exist in your life today. Are you not worried that another exile is coming? And this passage reminds us ultimately of, of the human condition. The human condition, lest we be too harsh on the Israelites, is that we, by nature, have the same diamond heart. Every single person's reaction to God's law is no. I don't want you to tell me what to do. Not all of us scream, but we do resist. We do know best. And then God steps in and says, actually come this way. And we say, no. So we're not that different than Zechariah's people. But Zechariah ends chapter seven by reminding them, the exile came because we were disobedient. And you continue in this disobedience. The exile could come again. I grew up in Oregon, Southern Oregon, and I lived on, on the I-5, so like Grants Pass, Oregon, you can get north-south very easy, and we were two hours inland from the coast. So every summer, my mom and dad would drive us to the coast. We would play in the water. Uh, Oregon coast, if you've ever been, like the beach there, not California. It, like it's not white, sandy, it's kind of ugly, and the riptide is crazy strong, so you kind of don't swim. And if you do swim, you're aware that the tide is coming in. So mom and dad would say, play in the tidal pools, play in the water. But as soon as the tide starts coming in, get out of the water. And they knew the tide comes in every single day, multiple times a day, like clockwork. And if you pretend like it's not coming in, you will get ripped out to sea. And Zechariah is saying that to his people. The tide is coming in. You have not changed the way you live. Turn back to God, get out of the water or the tide will come in and will rip you out to sea. Zechariah's people, not all of them at least, heeded his warning. And I think this gives us a great challenge that we ought to respond to the warning. Uh, if you are here, you're not a Christian and you're wondering, does God want anything of me? The answer is yes. God demands your obedience. God invites your obedience. God offers forgiveness. He offers his mercy and then asks you to follow him, to obey what he has commanded. Don't miss this opportunity. It's never too late to turn back to God. That was the old heart. Let's talk about the new heart. Zechariah 7, 8 to 10 the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner or the poor and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. These three verses are the ones I skipped in my first reading because I wanted to circle back to it after we talk about the human condition. The human condition, according to Zechariah, is diamond hearts. We, we don't really want to be coached. And Jesus actually gives us an even more clear passage in Mark chapter 7 that gives us the, an even better picture of the human condition. Mark 7, Jesus is debating religious leaders on the question of what makes people unclean, like what makes us dirty or wicked. And this is what he says. He, being Jesus, Mark 7, 20, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, uh, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Jesus claims that all of your sin originates not in other people, not in the world around you, but actually in your heart. So the Christian story, the Christian message begins pretty terribly. It's quite sad. Things are not well. You have a diamond heart. All of your sinfulness comes from within. But the Christian story isn't just that. Christian people don't just say the building's on fire. Christian people say there's actually a guy who like put out the fire. There's actually a guy who can save you and change you 
and change everything about you. The Christian message is that God made a way through Christ that by dying on the cross, he paid the sacrifice for, for the sin that you have. Sin is disobedience against God. And any person can simply say, I'm with that guy and be forgiven of their sin. The Christian message is a reminder that God has done something to save us from our condition and then simply gives the offer, follow me, respond to this invitation. And more than that, the response isn't just a, hey, I hope you figure it out, come over here. It's actually God empowering you to respond. Listen to this, Ezekiel 36, this is what God does so that people can actually receive the offer. Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Zechariah mourned that people had diamond hearts and wouldn't receive coaching, wouldn't receive correction. Ezekiel promises that God is going to do something one day, which he's done through Jesus, where he will actually change people's hearts. And if they have a different heart, they can come to him. That diamond heart no longer exists, and they can actually receive correction. They can actually hear the warning, and they can turn and follow God. So if people have new hearts, the big question for us is what follows next? Like if you have a new heart and you've said, okay, I'm going to follow Jesus. God, give me that new heart. God, I want to follow you. I don't really know what that looks like, but I want to live like a Christian. What does that mean? Well, Zechariah 7 has three pairs of words that paint us a pretty good picture of the new Christian life. How should Christian people act in the world? So listen to this. Verse 9 gives us a few phrases and then verse 10. Verse 9, the first phrase I want to focus on is true judgment. Right, so this word, true judgment, it's a pair of words. And the words, the, the words in Hebrew are words that God uses about himself in the way he relates to his people that he's in covenant with. So God relates to people in that he is faithful or true to them. And then God in judgment means God honors their rights or God has duties towards them. So faithful duties is another way that we could render that phrase of true judgments. So God is faithful in performing his duties in caring for the people he's connected to. And then God says to his people, you should be like that. You should be faithful in carrying out your duties. If if we were gonna use more modern English, we would say promote social harmony. Like God's design for God's people is that they would be the kind of people that helped other people get along that they were the kind of people who actually took the first step in getting along with others. God's design is that his people would meet the needs of their community and in so doing, promote social harmony. The second phrase is a pair again, kindness and mercy. And both of these words, again, are used of Yahweh in how he relates to his people, right? Kindness, meaning God's loyalty, and mercy or tenderness, So God is loyal and tender towards his people. His people mess up. And God tenderly comes back to them and says, listen, I'm gonna give you another chance. And God says, my people should do that. God's design for his people is that they would build healthy relationships by giving second chances, by initiating relationship, by going back to people, even people that maybe aren't the nicest or haven't been the kindest in the past and saying, I I wanna show you mercy. I want to lean in. The third phrase is care for orphans and widows. This comes out of 10. This command is actually given in the negative, in the actual passage, but for convenience, I'm turning it to the positive. In God's design is that his people would care for orphans and widows. This is God's design because this is the heart of God throughout the Old Testament. When scripture speaks of the way God relates to people or the people God is most concerned for, the phrase that most consistently gets used through the law and through the Psalms is this phrase, that God cares for the orphans and widows. And God's design is that his people would also care for orphans and widows. And yes, it means actual orphans, like people with no, or kids with no parents, and widows, like women whose husbands died or men whose wives died. But more than that, it's a phrase that means people that have no defender. Like people that have no help, no advocate, no one that is defending them or taking their side in a world that is very happy to take advantage of people that are vulnerable. 
God's design is that his people would promote social harmony, build healthy relationships like within the group, and then continue doing that as they look out to a world that has tremendous need where there are orphans and widows and keep doing the same things, promote social harmony and build healthy relationships with people that have no defender. These three little verses in Zechariah 7 paint a profound picture of God's design for his people. A beautiful picture of God's design for his people. If Christians follow this model, would our world not be a better place? If all people follow this model, would our world not be a better place? Uh, this is why Christians are so bold as to say God's laws lead to life. God's laws lead to life for all people because God's law is the one that tells us this is how you act. This is how I've treated you. And then the God who uses the golden rule for us says, in the same way I've treated you, go and treat others. God's law makes a better world. And to help you see it, I want to give you a little graphic. Uh, we speak often here about deeply rooted disciples, right? And we use the image of the tree, right? God's design is that you would grow and you would put down deep roots. And our goal as a church is we want to bring people in and we want them to grow. We want them to have deep roots. The only issue with this picture is it gives the impression that the tree is simply meant to grow. But if a tree is growing, what does it produce? Fruit, right? And fruit is actually like, in the life cycle of a tree, fruit is what happens after it has flowered and the fruit protects the seeds of that tree. And those seeds are actually meant to go. God's design, if you flip to the next slide, is that deeply rooted disciples would go out into the world. That people who've actually grown up, who have become the kind of person God has designed, a person who promotes social harmony, a person who builds deep relationships, a person who cares for the orphan and the widow, actually has to go and care for the orphan and the widow. You actually have to go out. So God's design is that deeply rooted disciples would make an impact in the world around them. I started this sermon with that little phrase, right? New hearts lead to new lives. This is what Zechariah 7 reminds us of, that if a person is a Christian, they have a new heart, God's design is that they would lead a new kind of life. Christians must impact the world around us. It is a non-optional part of the Christian life. So I want to give you two examples of the ways that Northview is already impacting the world around us. And I want to invite you into those as the people of this church. So we're going to focus on that phrase from Zechariah 7 and 710, right? The caring for the orphans and widows, right? God's design for his people is not just that we would treat others kindly, but that we would actually go out and find people, people that might not even be interested in a relationship with us, and make an impact in their life. Do something to help them. Meet their needs. So Zechariah 7.10 tells us care for the orphans. So if we're just going to take that phrase in the most literal, it means like people that have no parents, little people with no parents. But more broadly, it means people that have no defender. And the two demographics that are most at risk in our world are at-risk youth, people with like youth with unstable homes and preborn children, right? So little people not yet out of the womb. And Northview has formal partnerships with two groups that help those people. Uh, we are partnered with Advocate and with Cyrus Center. Each of these organizations is in the Fraser Valley and they go out into the world to care for the orphan. They do this because they are Christians. And we ought to support them in that through praying for them but more than that, according to Zechariah 7, we're actually commanded to join in the effort. So I want to invite you boldly to help these organizations. You can give directly to them. You can serve directly with them. That second little phrase from Zechariah 7.10, caring for widows. Right? Widows, again, in the narrowest sense, is a woman whose husband has died. But again, if, if we're going to take that to mean, like, in the broadest, people with, with no protector, people with no defender... Right? A, a widow is a, a symbol of someone in deep mourning, someone who has no one to help them as they've suffered one of the greatest losses a person can live through, the, the breaking of their covenant as their spouse has died. We, as a church, interact with people all the time that are mourning. And people that are mourning 
forget to do the basic things. They forget to cook. Uh, they need someone to listen to, but they forget to reach out. And if we want to be the kind of people that go to the orphan and the widow, that go to help someone who is hurting, uh, we can give to North Youth's Care Fund. North Youth's Care Fund is designed to help people in our community. Every time you give to this fund, you are helping people in our community, and not all of them are Christian. Some of them come simply because they need help. And Zechariah 7, 10 reminds us that God's design for his people is that we would actually help. You can do this on your own at any time simply by helping someone who you know that has a need. And you can partner with our church by giving to this fund so that we can continue to help people and provide counseling and help with rent and groceries, things that people need, things that people forget about when they are in deep, deep suffering. I want to challenge you with that little picture of that tree, the seeds that go out. God's design for his people is that we would impact the world around us. Christians have not always been well-liked in history. Maybe you're hearing all this and you're thinking, I would love to help, but people don't want my help because they know I'm a Christian. Uh, Christians have not always been popular. The dislike that we have culturally is not a new thing. There's a great story in Acts 17. Paul and Silas are preaching in Thessalonica and people are responding and some people are mad. There's opposition. A riot starts. And the charge that the rioters bring against Paul and Silas is these men have turned the world upside down. They want to change everything. That phrase was used pejoratively. It was used in the negative against these missionaries. But it's a pretty good summary of God's design for his people. We, we do, we should want to turn the world upside down. We should want the world to be way different than it actually is. And every time we see something happen that's not good, God commands us. You have a new heart. You live a new life. Be part of the change in that. Uh, Mark, our lead pastor, as he has put together all the texts for this rebuild series, his heart was not just, ooh, new worship center out back. His heart is deeply rooted disciples. And deeply rooted disciples that go unto the world. You don't have to go very far to do that. There's lots of work here in the Fraser Valley. And if you want to go far, people like Sean and Amy are going all the way across the world. God's design for his people is that they would turn the world upside down, that we would have different families, different interpersonal skills, different time boundaries, different ways of handling our money. Everything about us changes because we want to foster social harmony. We want to build healthy relationships and we want to go to the orphan and the widow and actually alleviate their suffering. Turn the world upside down. And the only way you can do this is if you have the new heart. But according to Ezekiel 36, what God has done for his people, for every Christian, is he's given you a new heart so that you can lead a new life. So live the new life. Let me pray for us, and then I'll invite the music team back up. Father God, thank you for this day and for this word. Lord, uh, it's a challenge. It's a hard thing to read a text uh, that reminds us of how hard-hearted we can be of the human condition, and then even the reality that post new heart, Lord, we still battle the leftover remains of that sin nature where we want to do our own thing. So Father, I pray that by your spirit, you would move the hearts of people here, uh, that they would hear a generous invitation by the God of the universe to join in his mission rather than a uh, burdensome command to just do a bunch of things. God, we, we live this way because you loved us first and transformed us and are still transforming us. So, Father, I pray for every person here. I pray for Northview Church, Lord, that we would be the kind of place that makes a better world. Father, we trust you. We know you're working. We know your mission will not stop. So help us, empower us as we join in that mission. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.